Hello TutorMed community, it's Kofi here and welcome back to the TutorMed channel where our primary aim is to simplify medicine. We will continue with our discussion on urinalysis and in this video we want to look at the first part of the panel which is the physical appearance of urine into details. Kindly subscribe if you haven't done that yet and let's get started. Before we begin today's topic, I would like to rectify something in our last video about the mnemonic for the parameters which make up the dipstick. The mnemonic was, give him a slap, bank, I gave what every letter stood for, except for the letter A in the word slap. And so let's take a look at the mnemonic again. G stood for or stands for glucose H for him for blood S for specific gravity L for leukocyte esterase and the A which I omitted actually stood or stands for albumin which is the main protein then P for the pH of urine then B for bilirubin, specifically the conjugated um, part or form. Then U for urobilinogen. N for nitrites. And then K for ketones. So please take note that the A in the West lab stands for albumin. And we will look at this more when we talk about urine dipstick in our next video. When do we decide to do a urinalysis for a patient? There are a number of reasons, but to mention a few. 1. Any patient suspected to have kidney disease, whether acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. So if a patient comes with a puffy face, decreased urine output, you may want to do a urinalysis. Number 2. Any patient suspected to have genitourinary malignancy. Third, to evaluate any patient who comes with hematuria or red urine. And four, to monitor the progression of renal diseases like nephrotic syndrome. When you start therapy, you want to know if the proteins in the urine is improving or is going down. Sometimes, or even not sometimes, if a patient is suspected to have UTI, kidney stones, or ureteric stones, we do a urinalysis. And so for the specimen collection, the specimen should be collected into a clean, dry container to avoid contaminants. Then the patient is advised to clean the external genitalia and then provide a midstream urine or specimen which is actually a clean cut urine for analysis as you may see or as you may find out later genital urinary or genital secretions can make the urine turbid increasing the suspicion for infection when there is actually no infection the specimen should be examined at room temperature within two hours of collection and if not feasible, the sample should be refrigerated at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius and rewarmed prior to assessment. But this might lead to detection of crystals that may precipitate at cooler temperatures, but does not dissolve in solution when you rewarm the specimen. And so the clinician should know that crystals may precipitate out of the urine at cooler temperatures. And also, for patients with indwelling catheters, we should obtain the urine directly from the tubing instead of the urine bag. Having established these principles, now let's look at the first parameter in the gross assessment of urine or urine macroscopy, which is urine color. Normal urine color is anything from clear to amber or straw. But the urine color of a patient 
has a relationship with its volume status. For example, as demonstrated in this picture, the first represents a patient who is very, very well hydrated. His urine is very light or clear, while the patient who is severely dehydrated has a very concentrated urine, as shown by the last urine status. Now for pathological urine color changes, we will evaluate them using the three M's. The color changes could be red, brown, black, green. And so we will use the three M's. The first M is medical conditions. We are asking, has the patient got any medical condition which is making his urine change into this color? That is the first M. The second M is medications. Has the patient taken any medications which is changing his urine from the normal color to say red, like rifampicin? And the last M is meals. We could have few diets here, but to help us remember, we used M, meals. Is the patient eating anything which is making his urine change into this color? Is the patient eating beetroot which is causing his urine to be red? So the three M's medical conditions, medications, and then meals. Now, like we said, there are variable urine color changes, but by far, red is the most concerning to both the clinician and the patient. And so we will spend adequate time evaluating the patient who comes complaining of red to brown urine. What did we say we will use? Oh yes, you did remember, the three M's. The first M, medical conditions. Is there any medical condition that can make a patient's blood, or sorry, urine red to brown? One, bleeding or hematuria. So if you have bleeding from any site of the urinary tract, you will have red urine. So it could be a glomerular hematuria, like nephritic syndrome or a non-glomerular hematuria like tumors in any part of the urinary tract from the ureters, from the bladder, from the prostate, then stones in the urinary tract or schistosomiasis. Apart from bleeding, we have myoglobinuria, which is tumors, sorry, presence of myoglobin in urine as a result of maybe a crash injury or rhabdomyolysis. Then we have hemoglobinuria, which is the presence of free hemoglobin in urine from hemolysis. We will look at how to evaluate a patient with hematuria in another video. The next M is medications. Medications which can cause red to brown urine include rifampicin, which is an anti-tuberculous drug, phenytoin, which is an anticonvulsant, hydroxycobalamin used to treat vitamin B12 deficiency. The last M, meals. So if a patient has consumed beetroots, you would have red urine. Now, as you saw, there are several causes of red urine. And so how do we evaluate this complaint? Like we established in our previous videos, the very first step to interpreting any investigation is to have a sound background clinical history and physical exam. After doing that, you proceed to the urine RE or urinalysis. The urine is red. The next thing you do is to first centrifuge the specimen into a sediment and supernatant and see which of them has the red color. If it is the sediment, then it is hematuria. If it is supernatant, then it is not hematuria. Now, assuming the supernatant had a red color, the next thing to do is to do a urine dipstick on the supernatant for him or him, I should have said. If the him is positive, then it's either myoglobinuria or hemoglobinuria. If the him is negative, then it's because the red color was caused by either medications or meals. All right, and so you have a patient whose supernatant is rather red and then you did a heme test on the supernatant and then it was positive it means it's either myoglobinuria or hemoglobinuria what do you have to do to differentiate between them 
So you pick a blood sample and centrifuge the blood sample for plasma. If the plasma centrifuge or separated is clear, then it's myoglobinuria. If it is red, then it represents hemoglobinuria. The next slide will explain why. Now let's begin with hemoglobinuria. Hemoglobin is usually found in red blood cells but can appear as free molecules in blood when there is intravascular hemolysis. Now during hemolysis, the liver produces a molecule called haptoglobin to bind to these free hemoglobin molecules. When in blood, the hemoglobin is poorly filtered because it's large and often bound to haptoglobin. Please remember that from our first lecture, we said that a healthy glomerulus will not filter out very large molecules like hemoglobin. Now these hemoglobin molecules in blood exist as either tetramers or dimers. Tetramers have four subunits and dimers have two subunits. So you would agree that the tetramers are usually larger than the dimers. If the intravascular hemolysis is very significant, the amount of free hemoglobin will exceed the haptoglobin and so some will be unbound. And it is the unbound dimer which is filtered because of its relatively smaller size. And its presence in urine is called hemoglobinuria. Now from our previous slide, remember we said that when the plasma is centrifuged, or when the blood is centrifuged, it will be red. And this is because in intravascular hemolysis, much of the hemoglobin remains in the blood. This goes on to mean that you need significant hemolysis to give urine color change because significant hemolysis would exceed haptoglobin's binding capacity. Alright everyone, now myoglobin urea. Myoglobin, which is also a heme-containing molecule, is not found freely moving in blood like hemoglobin. It is found in muscle but can be in plasma, urine, rhabdomyolysis from any cause, whether from crash injury or from a myotoxic snake venom. Now in contrast to hemoglobin, however, it is easily filtered because 1. It is relatively smaller and then it is not protein bound like hemoglobin. So what do you think the clinical implication here would be? Because it is easily filtered, it does not stay in blood if the glomerulus is healthy doing its function of filtration. And so the plasma will be clear because of its high filtrability. Again, because it is highly filtered, you need smaller or relatively insignificant myoglobinemia to cause urine color change. Like mentioned earlier, apart from red, there are other discolorations, one of which is green. And so using the 3M model, medical conditions, we have Pseudomonas UTI, and then for medications, we have Amitriptyline and then Methyl Blue. It can be very white, and this can be caused by phosphate crystals, and then Chyluria, which is actually presence of lymph in urine. Now for black urine, a streams of hemoglobinuria and myoglobinuria can do this. Usually, hemoglobinuria gives you a red color, but a combination of prolonged transit time the nephron and then acidic urine may result in the formation of methemoglobinuria, which has a color-like urine. Then we move to the next thing in macroscopy, which is turbidity, and this can be caused by an infection, a precipitated crystal, chyluria, and then contamination from genital secretions. Thank you.